It's crazy the way some things have changed. Years ago, I didn't talk to guys like this, cops, prosecutors, but there was always honor, trust, and respect until there wasn't. And then came the betrayal. After that, me and hundreds of others, wise guys, flipped. Fuck going to jail. I walked away from John Gotti and the life. On the other side, it was a different world. This was the real trust and loyalty. They wanted nothing but the truth in return from me. Of course, testifying in court, but that didn't change the fact that these were the good guys. At times, they reminded me of my mother and my father, and I knew it was the time to change my life. I owed it to my bloodline, and I owed it to the Gravano family, generations after me. One thing that still bothers me to this day, they blame me for the Frankie the Chico car bombing. Another lie. This sit down is different. This time I'm getting the real truth from one of the good guys. He's a real heavyweight in law enforcement. Heard he's been face to face with some of the worst evils in the world. And today he's going to tell me the real story about who was involved with the bombing. He was the guy who interviewed Gas Pipe and others when they cooperated, and a whole lot more. Come with me to this meeting. Hear it for yourself. Hi, Michael. Uh, Sammy over here. We're about to do this, you know, meeting. It was long in the making. I talked with Tommy Day and uh, know a little bit about you. I heard of you years ago, but... Uh, now we're finally sitting down and having a little chat. Looking forward to it. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah, me too. You're doing some great work. I know you're doing a few books. It's a few yeah. books that I'm interested in. You know, I know you did, uh, with Tommy, you did the book Mob uh, Cops. Yeah, Friends of the Family, right. And I'd be very interested in talking about, you know, a lot of the things you are talking about, this uh, child case parts and you know, a lot of this stuff that you're aware sure. of, I'd love to hear about that stuff. Sure, sure. I know that um, when uh, when I got a message from your from Anna, we uh, she'd mentioned the um, the case that I that I ended my other book with, Crooked Brooklyn, uh, which was the case involving a dentist who um, who was basically who was stealing body parts um, right. from uh, from cadavers. Yeah, that's what I said when I heard about it. Right. And, um, you know, I, Sam, I've been, I've been around a long time and, uh, and I had seen a lot of things and I had done a lot of things. I had never seen or heard of anything, um, as, as horrible and horrific as this. And, um, and, and, you know, when, when the prosecutor who first learned about it came to me, uh, I'll, let me take you back into how we, how we got this. The, uh, um, there was a, there was a, a, a company, uh, uh, that owned many funeral homes around the country. And they bought a funeral home um, in Bensonhurst. And um, and when the owner, the new owner, went to the funeral home to, to look at it and to examine it after the purchase had been completed, she stumbled on a room on the second floor of the of the funeral home. And she walked in. And in, in there were, were two guys who were essentially, <laughs> to her, it looked like they were operating on a cadaver, on a, on a, on a, on a dead person. What they were doing is they were slicing open his legs and arms and whatever else they could do to steal bones out of this body. Their 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 boss, this guy Michael Mastro Marino, who was this defrocked dentist, um, had cut a deal with funeral directors all over the tri-state area: New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and uh, and this was one of the funeral homes that he had he had cut a deal with. And the deal was this. When someone died, the funeral director would tip off Master Marino that he had a fresh body coming into the funeral home, and uh, and Master Marino would then send his people to do what this woman saw them doing, which was to take the bone and tissue and whatever else they could they could harvest out of the body, for the purpose of then reselling it to companies, mainly in the South, in the in the southern part of the United States, who were processing these bones, et cetera, it's for use by reg by doctors and by dentists. So if you've ever had a dental implant, 
if you need if you if the dentist says that you don't have enough bone in order to hold the implant um, f- forever, then you have to have a bone transplant. And what they do is they cut a piece of the bone and they knit the bone knits, so it goes into the jaw, and um, and it knits. And when it's knitted and it's now uh, settled in there, then they can put the dental implant in. So right. this this is what this is what this dentist was doing. This was his business. And um, and when he lost his license, which he did because he was addicted to to Demerol, um, and and when he was operating one day on, on someone's mouth, he actually fell asleep in the middle of the operation. And that was the first that was one of many violations that he had had things that he had done as a dentist. And he lost his license. Now, the guy was making a lot of money, Sam. A lot of money, and he was living. He lived in a mansion in Fort Lee, New Jersey. He um, he had he, he lived very high. You know, he had a very uh, uh, I guess a a the kind of life that a millionaire lives because he was a millionaire and he was making money from all of his dental procedures. Now that was gone. He was going to lose all of that. So he had to figure out a way to continue to continue to make money and to uphold his lifestyle. And he knew about, you know, the bone transplant and the bone. But but he also knew that there wasn't many, many. There wasn't much of that around. People weren't people weren't giving anybody permission to take the bone and tissue out of their loved one's body before they were buried or before they were cremated. That just wasn't happening. So there was a shortage of of, of bone and tissue for transplant. He recognized that and he started to try to get permission from families to do this legitimately. He got nothing. He got zero. So what he did was he fell, he fell back on this procedure of bribing these funeral directors into tipping them off to the to dead bodies and he would send his people to the funeral home and um, and they would they would ravage the body. Now, the question that everybody asks me when I tell them this is, well, would the family know that when they laid the body out? Because, you know, it, it, it would look emaciated. It would look, you know, like it would, it would not have any, you know, any substance to it. Well, they knew that as well. They meaning the bad guys. So what they would do is they bought PVC pipe and they would substitute the bone that they had taken out in the legs and in the arms with PVC pipe, sewed it back up. And then it would look like the arm would be, you know, would be like a regular arm. That's what was happening. When this woman bought this funeral home, she went over and asked them what they were doing. And one of the guys was very honest. He said, we're, you know, we're harvesting bone. 